Exploring the Victorian era often conjures images of opulent homes, exquisite gowns, and intense romanticism. Thanks to fiction, however, reality proves to be stranger and, well, less fragrant. Despite their luxurious trappings, Victorians were, to put it plainly, not the paragons of cleanliness. Behind the veneer of lace and silk, indoor plumbing was non-existent and regular bathing was a rarity. Diseases ran rampant and the attempted hygienic remedies were sometimes as unpleasant, if not more so, than the ailments themselves. In this exploration of Victorian hygiene, we'll delve into the less glamorous side of this historical period. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel before we embark on this aromatic journey into Victorian England. Laundry day for the Victorians wasn't just about soap and water. They had some unique tricks up their sleeves for keeping their clothes pristine. To tackle oil and grease stains, they'd vigorously rub chalk into the fabric. Grass and blood stains? Kerosene was their go-to solution. And for miscellaneous odors, a surprising remedy emerged. Milk. These may sound like tips from a modern life hack video, but the Victorian approach to bleaching takes the cake. Brace yourself. They soaked their clothes in their own urine. Yes, it might sound repulsive, but urine contains ammonia, a potent cleaning agent. Just don't try it on your windows. Trust me on that one. While toothbrushes and toothpaste were indeed available to the Victorians, they were primarily enjoyed by the middle and upper classes. The working class had to get resourceful with their oral care. Homemade toothpaste was a common solution, crafted from everyday items like chalk, soot, or even powdered cuttlefish. The era's toothbrushes sported wooden handles, harsh bristles, and were far from comfortable to use. Despite being relatively pricey, those who couldn't afford them had to resort to alternative methods, such as using celery, believed to have abrasive properties while being chewed. Though not ideal, it was better than nothing. Unfortunately, the dental care available at the time was, to put it kindly, quite daunting. Access to dentists was limited in many areas, leading people to seek oral care from local barbers or blacksmiths if needed. The earliest indoor toilets, also called water closets, were a convenience in their time, even though they existed before the advent of indoor plumbing. However, they came with a less than pleasant downside. Without pipes to carry away waste, it simply dropped into a sizable cesspool located in the building's basement. While better than an outhouse and less exposed than a chamber pot, the cesspool had its drawbacks, eventually filling up and turning the entire house into an unpleasant smelling space. To combat the odors, a cottage industry of night soil men emerged. These workers would empty the cesspool and sell the waste to farmers, who used it as fertilizer. The term night soil men originated from the era's laws, which restricted cesspool emptying to nighttime, deeming it too disturbing a task for broad daylight. Taking a bath might seem like a straightforward task, but in Victorian times, it wasn't common knowledge. As regular bathing gained popularity, publishers flooded the market with books to guide the uninitiated through the process. However, much of this guidance was more tradition than science. For instance, one book advised Victorians to steer clear of bathing within four hours of a large meal, a rule that persists today, though now it's commonly associated with swimming after eating rather than bathing. Another tip suggested avoiding washing the face while traveling unless the water could be purified with ammonia or alcohol. The advice even delved into Russian baths involving alternating between extremely hot and cold water for those concerned about preventing wrinkles. In our modern era, hair care is a universal obsession and the Victorian times were no different albeit with a lack of our contemporary shampoos. So, how did they keep their hair clean? Well, women of that era often turned to eggs. They would crack an egg over their heads, work the yolks into their hair, and then rinse it out with a pitcher of water, a primitive version of today's shampoo routine. 
Another popular option involved using diluted vinegar for that morning fresh scent. Eggs and vinegar weren't the only unconventional choices. Rum, black tea, and rosemary were all considered normal and effective alternatives for hair washing. Maintaining youthful and vibrant looks has always been a priority for many, and the Victorians were no exception. In the pursuit of ageless beauty, Hall's Vegetable Sicilian Hair Renewer, introduced in the 1860s, became a popular choice in the era's hair care routines. Promising to darken hair and conceal grey, the product had a hidden danger, lead as a bonding agent. While effective in its intended purpose, it came with the unintended consequence of causing lead poisoning. Eventually, the manufacturer addressed this concern by reducing the lead content in the formula, allowing Hall's hair renewer to remain on the market until the 1930s. In Victorian times, unpleasant odors weren't just disliked, they were considered downright dangerous. The prevailing belief, known as the miasma theory or night air, traced back to antiquity, claimed that diseases like cholera and chlamydia were transmitted through pollutants in unclean air. Victorians, particularly in the impoverished districts of London, strongly adhered to this theory, attributing poor health to the wicked smells wafting through the streets. Even Florence Nightingale, a renowned nurse, subscribed to this belief, advocating for clean air as a remedy for patients' health. However, while there was a connection between foul smells and poor health, it wasn't the direct cause Victorians thought. As it turns out, the prevalent poor sanitation in industrial areas of the time was independently responsible for both the bad odors and many of the diseases. Victorian hygiene had its challenges, but it marked a significant shift in history as mainstream society began addressing the concerns of feminine hygiene. Notably, the late 19th century saw the invention of both disposable pads and early versions of tampons. While these innovations took time to become commonplace, women of the era displayed ingenuity in the interim. Interestingly, they repurposed the wood pulp base used in bandages for treating soldiers' wounds during wartime for menstruation care. Residents of New York, London, or Hong Kong can attest that even modern big cities develop a unique aroma in the heat of summer. However, the noxious smell that permeated London in 1858 was on a different level altogether. It was so overwhelmingly foul that the entire city practically ground to a halt. In the Victorian era, the River Thames served as the epicenter of London's sewage system. In practice, this meant that most citizens disposed of their waste by simply dumping it into the river. Unsurprisingly, Londoners were displeased and vociferously complained about the putrid odors emanating from the water. Doctors, adhering to the miasma theory, attributed the stench to causing widespread disease throughout the city. The unbearable situation led to the infamous summer of 1858, being forever remembered as the Great Stink. In the past, a variety of bizarre culprits, from bad smells to evil spirits, were blamed for causing diseases. Among the oddest was the Victorian-era belief that tuberculosis and its transmission could be attributed to women's clothing. According to doctors of the time, long skirts trailing on the streets were thought to pick up the disease, and women unknowingly brought sickness into their homes, spreading it to their families. This theory extended beyond dresses. Doctors also implicated tight corsets, contending that they contributed to tuberculosis by restricting lung function. As a result, in their efforts to curb the spread of the disease, doctors often recommended more comfortable corsets and shorter skirts. Quite the fashionable prescription. Although frowned upon socially during the Victorian era, escort work was a prevalent means of income for women in London's most impoverished neighborhoods. Given the widespread prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases, STDs at the time, and the limited availability of contraceptives, 
Sex workers often unknowingly transmitted these diseases to their clients. The clients, in turn, passed them on to their wives and any other individuals they were involved with. The situation escalated to the point where the spread of STDs was deemed a public health hazard. Consequently, laws were enacted permitting the police to detain escorts and mandate their treatment for STDs. While Listerine, the mouthwash we're familiar with today, wasn't widely promoted until 1914, it was actually invented by Dr. Jordan Lawrence and chemist-turned-entrepreneur Jordan Wheat Lambert in 1879. In the slow transition towards accepting modern hygiene practices, Lambert initially marketed his creation as a medical antiseptic. Unfortunately, the product was overlooked, failing to generate profits. Undeterred, Lambert explored various, often unconventional uses for Listerine. Before settling on marketing it as a mouthwash, he pitched it as everything from a floor cleaner to a remedy for dandruff and gonorrhea. So, considering these historical twists, would you have relished living in the Victorian era? Share your thoughts in the comments below.